There we go. Excellent, and we're on. The participants Ooh. showing up already, what we'd like to see. Oh, wow, okay. So guys, we're, for those of you who've already dialed in, we're just gonna give people a couple of minutes to arrive and get settled. Um, I'm sure people are gathering their lunch to have over these sessions, we've, as we've done it over lunchtime. I'm gonna give people a few minutes, I think like every day, just to arrive, and then we'll kick off in a few minutes. I'm expecting big numbers today, the the, uh, the world of uh, testing and databases. So I'm expecting <laughs> this to be our biggest one of the week. Yeah, well, yeah. It's getting a, and it's getting a little bit tougher every day, I think, joking, judging by the quizzes, right? And so I think we're now getting into, into the really meaty stuff. Um, yeah, and I think with, with testing and databases, definitely not the most eye-catching subject at all. Um, you know, it's not, it's not typically the one that you're going to see lots of uh, exciting articles about and, and kind of cutting-edge revolutions, but at the same time, um, there isn't a, an IT or a developer out there that doesn't need to have some good knowledge of, of testing and databases. So almost any role you're hiring for, there's probably going to be something related to a database or a testing tool on that person's yeah, CV. Um, so while it's maybe not the most attractive, it's definitely very, very important to have at least a base level right. understanding of it. Yeah, for sure, Phil. Uh, totally agree. Uh, our numbers still, still numbers going up. So. Guys, you've just dialed in. Uh, we've not started yet. We're just giving people uh, a minute or two to arrive. I think once those numbers slow down a little bit, we'll uh, we'll kick off the session. So don't worry, you've not missed anything yet. And as always, you'll get all the content emailed to you at the end. Um, but if you want to start getting your um, salutations into the comments or questions into the Q&A, uh, then do start doing that already. Uh, with the Q&A, uh, if you can select all participants that means everyone can see the questions that means we'll more likely be able to get to your question more quickly as well and, and increase the yeah. likelihood of getting answered okay. you're talking about the chat there dale the uh the uh, all participants oh. is in the um is in the chat not q a oh thank you phil uh, so, sorry thank you darren yeah no i'll be uh but yeah i'll be on top of the q a today any little questions that you guys get in that i think um or better answering in text, I'll, I'll just pop you an answer straight away if it's specifically if it's, if it's personal to kind of your business. Um, obviously, any wider questions, either I'll put to, to Darren and Dale, um, or we'll, we'll obviously get back to you with the answers on those. I know we've got a, a massive buildup of, of questions to get back to you guys on. Um, we are slowly walking, working through this. I'm sure you guys could appreciate, obviously, we're uh, working on a, a new training uh, session for each day, which obviously we're, we're working through the, the new ones coming up. We haven't forgotten about any of those questions though. Um, and anything that we haven't answered throughout the course of uh, the, the, the upcoming training sessions, we will 100% be getting back to you guys You guys on. A few of them we've kind of left uh, to one side because we'll either touch on them tomorrow in the modern software engineering or next week when we do a, a real deep dive into kind of DevOps, cloud computing um, and all of that side of things. Oh, thanks, Phil. So I think we've creeped over our magic 100 for today. So and that's just slowing down a little bit. So I think we're probably ready to go. We've got a couple of questions in the Q&A. First check. So I think we'll kick off. So hello, guys. Uh, welcome to day four of Hacker Jobs Tech Recruitment Training. And today we're going to be uh, delving into the very complex world of testing and database, QA, data engineering, those sort of things. Um, and as, as the title says here, the engineers making sure everything runs smoothly for, for a product and tech team. Um, as always, we are joined by Darren um, and Phil, who are going to be guiding us through the session. So Darren's going to be leading the content and Phil's going to be manning your, your sessions and adding uh, little details of uh, nuggets of knowledge as we go. And I think Dave is also us while moderating everything as well. Uh, to any issues um, that you can come to her. I'm just going to see if I can skip my slides. Great. Um, so as we mentioned yesterday, for those of you who were here, um, the Slack group is now live. I think we'll be sending you um, instructions on how to join the Slack group in the update uh, this afternoon, this evening. So looking forward to um, answering even more of your questions on that. Uh, just a reminder, um, if you can uh, make your comments and questions uh, available to all participants, um, that means everyone can see what you're saying and we'll be able to get to those comments and questions uh, a little bit quicker for you. Um, 
think you will know by now that any issues getting on board, you just email hello at HackerJob and we'll make sure you get the link each day. It's a, a different link. We can't do recurring webinars in Zoom, unfortunately. Um, and we've been overwhelmed by um, positive feedback and response we've got. So thank you very much. It's very rewarding for the guys um, who are sharing a, a wealth of knowledge um, from this subject area and also doing a lot of research to make sure we're getting all the details right for you. Um, so if you've been enjoying the course, tell your friends. Um, there's the YouTube series you, which we're emailing you and updating uh, each day. Uh, so you can share with your friends either over Twitter and you can mention us with the, with the handle at hackerjob underscore co or LinkedIn and using the hashtags on either of those platforms, either hashtag tech training, tech recruitment or recruitment would be fantastic. Um, and anyone who wants to catch up uh, who hasn't been here, um, what a great way of spending an evening watching an hour or two of um, these tech um, videos instead of perhaps catching up on your latest episode of The Crown or uh, The Tide King, whatever your preference may be on Netflix. Uh, and I guess I should say any, uh, other streaming services are also available. Uh, again, just a reminder, points being prizes, so the daily quiz, so the link for that will be going into the chat, I think now, and also as a reminder at the end of the session, uh, and uh, whoever scores the most uh, points over the course of the, the, the almost two week sessions uh, wins the Amazon voucher for £500. And for anyone that attends six out of the nine courses this week and next week, uh, will be invited to the very prestigious Hacker Job Wine Club. So we send um, uh, some bottles of wine to your home and then you're invited to join a Zoom chat where a qualified and um, very entertaining sommelier will talk you through the wine. So not only a way of uh, enjoying your Friday night, but also to get a bit more socialization in our days of lockdown as we are here in the UK. Moving swiftly on, so just a reminder, uh, we're on day four now. So going on uh, testing and databases with uh, tomorrow running off the week with modern software engineering. And most of next week is dedicated to the DevOps piece. And just a reminder that Friday is the bank holiday next week. Um, you can also vote for upcoming courses. Sorry, Darren. I, I believe that, just so everyone knows, I believe that Thursday, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, but with the likelihood is we'll move that to something more data focused um, off the back of people requesting it. Yeah, so just to give people a bit of flavor of, of kind of what's coming up. So tomorrow, Modern Software Engineering, we'll touch on four of the kind of more modern languages uh, that we're starting to see onboarded. I think Scala is probably the, the most popular at the moment, but also Kotlin, Go and Rust. Um, we'll also look at some modern en software engineering concepts like microservices, uh, cloud computing, distributed systems, things we might have mentioned earlier in the week that you might have kind of had a few questions about. So we'll cover off uh, all of that sort of stuff, as well as multi-threading, which I know came up a lot yesterday um, when we were talking about single-threaded applications and why they maybe weren't uh, right for your business. So we'll, we'll go into a lot of depth on that. And then, yeah, I think next week, um, it looks like we're going to do three days on DevOps. So nice introduction, um, big focus on kind of cloud computing, and then we'll be able to roll the tooling and the operating systems in together on Wednesday. And then Thursday, I think we'll focus on um, kind of data science, data engineering. Fantastic. And there's also an updated poll so you can vote for future course subjects as well. And I think that link will be going to the chat at some point over the course of, uh, of, the, of the next 50 minutes or so. So today's agenda, I think without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass you over to Darren, who's going to be our, our uh, leader today. Um, thank you very much, Darren. Cool. So um, as you can see on the agenda, there's a lot to cover today. So um, I will move through stuff swiftly, but hopefully we'll give you enough information, like always drop stuff into the chat, drop stuff into the Q&A. If it's something that um, Phil thinks is worth um, adding into the conversation as we go, we'll, uh, we'll do so. I think just so something to highlight very quickly, we've already had one question through, just can we access previous courses that we missed? Uh, so I believe Daisy has popped into the chat a link to our YouTube series. So the three yep. that we've, we've done so far are up there on YouTube. Absolutely, you can, uh, you can access those. Great. Uh, next slide, uh, Darren? Yes, please. Thank you. Now, let me try. There we go, testing. And so, cool. Darren, what is software testing? Cool. So software testing, one of uh, very much like when someone says data and talking about tech, it's so ambiguous. So what a software tester is to, to me, 
probably might be a little bit different to what it is to you and probably is very different to what your mum and dad consider. So uh, hopefully that image gives you a bit of an idea about how everyone thinks is something slightly different. Cool. So um, I'll run through this slide quite quickly because we did it on Monday, but essentially there's several different types of QAs. There's a, a manual QA that is looking at user behavior and doing everything manually. Um, there's an automation tester who is looking at using uh, testing frameworks and, and testing tools to imitate the user behavior. So they're using to tools like Selenium and Specflow. And then there's software developers and tests, the rare beasts within the testing market um, who are essentially building their own testing frameworks from scratch. So we'll go through it ag again, but essentially a software tester, a uh, software developer and test is um, essentially as good at developing as they are uh, building testing frameworks. So they're very, very rare. The other okay. kind of tester that we'll often hear about, I've not put it on the slide, but you'll often hear penetration testing. So what penetration testing is, it's um, looking at how easy is it to hack into a system and how can we prevent them. So there's a really famous um, story of Sony back in, I believe, 2012, when they brought out the, the PlayStation 3 and someone broke into their uh, Sony network and took it down for about a week. So if you want to learn anything about penetration testing, please do uh, look into into that, it's a really, really famous and, and really interesting uh, case study. Yeah, Ooh, I think okay. it's important to highlight, so pen testers sit within security essentially. Um, QAs are, are focused on the quality of the system, how well it runs, the runtime, um, as well as balancing the loads and, and, and things like that. So um, while they are testers, that, well, they, they share that tester title, um, they're more focused on ensuring that your system's secure rather than your system runs as efficiently as it could and it's not full of bugs. Exactly. And so typically not not a core member of a uh, of a product team typically not part of the QA team no got it okay and just to clarify the unicorn icons think it symbolizes that the um the software developer in test is very very scarce skill and very very high in in very very high demand right Darren? yeah exactly you'll hear you'll hear unicorn or purple squirrel are generally the terms you'll hear in the uh, in the recruitment <laughs> market for these kind of uh, roles yeah, uh, and if there are suggestions for what to call them, uh, do do put them in the chat. We've asked <laughs> yeah, some, please uh, do. some of those. Yeah, we've had one question so far. Um, well, we've had we've had a few, but quite a lot of them are on unit testing things like that. We're going to come on to unit testing a little bit later in the presentation, so please do bear with us on that. Um, but Michelle Harrington Smith has asked, "What is performance or load? So performance slash load testing. What are they?" Um, so I, I'm happy to to answer this one. Um, so performance testing is, is very broad. You're, you're testing the performance of your system. So performance testing is essentially an umbrella term for most of testing, really. Um, when you're looking at load testing, it's the process of making sure that the demands you put on certain parts of the system um, are, how, how to put it, are, are essentially working. So within software development, you have a concept called load balancing, which is making sure that the data that you're sending and the amount of load that you're essentially putting on different parts of the system is balanced so that you know it's all working efficiently and you're not asking one part of your system so one microservice let's call it which we'll come on to tomorrow to do too much at once it's making sure that the the load is shared evenly and load testing is essentially just making sure that that, that load is is shared easily we'll come right. on to that a little bit later with apache j meter as well great excellent Cool. So um, I've put a couple of different testing methodologies on this. It's not exhaustive. These are the ones that you often will see people talking about. Um, so except in testing, you often see UAT um, when trying to use an acronym for that. So acceptance testing is looking at the behaviors of users and of uh, people internally and looking at does the machine do what we expect it to do? Does it achieve the, the expected result? Um, black box testing, uh, black box think airplanes. So black box testing is examining the functionality of the application, but looking at the, the functionality as a whole, rather than looking at the internal systems and the internal applications. Whereas um, white, uh, white box is, is the inverse. So you're looking much more at the internal application rather than the functionality. Bit. So it kind of covers both sides. And then integration testing, integration testing is looking at uh, individual modules and then grouping them up and testing them together to make sure that 
when you put all the, the modules together, do they still work as expected, um, like they do individually? Yeah. Don't know if you've got anything to add there, Phil? Uh, possibly just on integration testing. So uh, integration testing is probably the newest of, of, of those concepts there. Um, and that's basically because it's, it's heavily tied. If you've got a very strong agile culture, very strong DevOps culture, where you do have, you know, distribute teams or you do or, or even a local team but you have multiple developers working on multiple different features at once that you need to kind of put together and uh into a full application or, or a new feature set or whatever that may be you obviously need to make sure that all of those separate parts play nicely with each other so having uh, a good integration testing process uh, is key if you're looking to work in a in a, in a truly agile manner right and that um, uh, acceptance testing at the start, Darren, that we mentioned, that relates to the, the user stories or requirements that are coming from uh, the product or project manager or business analyst, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Okay. So um, the, the pain with trying to, f um, the QA and testing guys are, tr are trying to un uncover are, are the bugs in the code. Um, and this uh, little image illustrates that often as testers uh, un uncover code, um, uncover those bugs that often new ones uh, appear. I think that's right, Darren. Yeah, ex exactly. And I, I think that what's interesting about testing is that uh, you would, uh, I think, historically, once you created a uh, a piece of software or an application, you would consider it done. That's not the case at all. You're always going to develop more bugs when you add to to it. So think of um, uh, going going to games. So think if you're a gamer, think about patches. The patches within a game are continuously changing as, as new bugs come up. So as you're adding more code, you're going to get more bugs. So never consider your uh, your testing to be done on an application. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So tell us about manual testing then. Cool. So manual testing, the, the, the fundamental 101 for software testing is that 100% automation is not possible. So I'm sure at some point someone in the chat will ask some question, okay, do we need manual testing? Is it important anymore? The answer is yes. So a, a manual tester is there to identify as many defects as possible and they'll send them back to developers to fix. What they're essentially looking for, and we'll move on to it with automation in a, in a bit, but manual testers are trying to ensure that anything that a computer wouldn't pick up on is being done by them. So the advantages of it is that you're identifying problems related to human behavior, like I say, that computers wouldn't be able to find. And the disadvantages is it's very labor intensive and expensive because you are asking someone to manually click on lots of buttons or manually go through a lot of functionality. So you need quite a few people in a manual team depending on how big your application is. Yeah, yeah I think manual testers are good for identifying new issues. Um, yeah. Just to kind of reiterate that, like once you know what the problems are, yeah, you can write an automation script that's gonna cover off, does this button work? Does this do what it's supposed to do? But if you haven't identified what the problems are first, then it's hard to write an automation script and kind of guess. Uh, so that's where exactly. a manual tester really adds benefit still um, in that they can uncover those edge cases that maybe you wouldn't have uh, thought of, of before. Great. Perfect. So moving on to then automation testing. Cool. So essentially in, in layman's terms, if you like, um, what automation testers are doing is they're separating using separate software uh, from the software where you're coding in to execute tests and then you compare the actual outcome to the, uh, to the predicted outcome. So they're using um, these tools to ultimately save time, money, and manpower. Um, and then it's easily recorded, so it's easier to run uh, a test suite in the, in the future. So once you've run it once, you kind of get the results you expect. Um, you can then know, okay, we can automate this and we can make sure that this happens going forward. The advantages of it is, it, like I was saying with manual testing, it's less labor intensive because you've got a computer doing a lot of the work and it takes a lot of the monotonous tasks away from what a manual tester would, would do. It also means that essentially you can uh, get the selenium that we'll run into a little bit later when talking about tools, but you can get selenium to press 100 buttons in a minute, whereas it might take a manual tester an hour to press those 100 buttons. Um, the disadvantage is, is it's recommended only for very stable systems and it's used mainly for regression testing. So what regression testing is essentially, regression testing is looking at, okay, once we've made a change and we've run the test, does it uh, run as we expect? So it's continuous testing as you're adding more, uh, adding more code to your, to your code base. Anything to add there, Phil? 
No, but I think we'll, we'll stop and take a few questions now, uh, if you guys are, are happy with that. But now I think that was a, a really good summary of, of kind of automation testing. Um, cool. So I'm going to fire this first one at yourself, Darren. I think I'll take the next one because, again, it kind of refers to uh, some of the work I've done for tomorrow. Um, cool. So a question from Jack Furness here. So with today's modern approach uh, and increasing use of DevOps and continuous integration, continuous deployment, which is almost rewriting the software lifecycle, do you think that software quality is now more in the hands of DevOps as opposed to QA? Uh, really good question, Jack. Um, so I think that potentially it's taken some of the, uh, some of the, the resource away from testing. You'll, you'll see testing teams tend to be smaller than they previously were. But I think that, that I described it uh, to, uh, to Phil and Dow earlier is, is the testing function is essentially the final guard. So what they're there to do is to make sure that anything that is missed by the DevOps team or the engineering team is still covered. I think that um, the software developers, by nature, they want to develop new code um, and DevOps teams want to deploy new code. So a, a QA team, they are their specialists to make sure that the code is running fine. So yes, there's some, there's some um, nuance taken away from it, but there's still a need for these kind of teams. Yeah, and the way I like to think about it is uh, they do they do sit within a similar sphere in terms of, you know, they're after that development process and they are uh, both focused on speed and quality, whereas DevOps is focused on speed, uh, you know, speed and capital letters and, and quality. QAs are focused on quality and capital letters and speed because obviously, you know, the, the slicker that your testing process is, the quicker that you can make sure that, you know, your code's not, not got any bugs and you can get it into production. That obviously increases your speed, but the main focus is to ensure the code quality is there. Same with DevOps. Yet the, the main focus is obviously to make sure that you're able to deploy new features into your system without breaking things. So, you know, it, it is that speed of deployment. But of course, that, you know, does come with more checks on quality. And there are opportunities within the DevOps process 100% to flag up errors that maybe have been missed or this part of the system doesn't play nicely with this part of the system. So, um, yeah, that's how I would kind of phrase it. Um, and then just quickly, so the one I was going to take, so we've had one from an anonymous attendee. So how, how do I differentiate between functional and non-functional testing? So this just comes down to functional and non-functional requirements, which again is something that we'll discuss tomorrow. So <laughs> a functional requirement um, is basically, does the system run? Does it do what it's intended to do? Does it function? Non-functional requirements are things around kind of speed of performance, usability, reliability, security, scalability. So not necessarily the things that um, will tell you, does, does my system get from A to B, but they'll tell you, does it get from A to B in a, you know, a relatively quick time? Does it get to, from A to B in a secure way? Will it get from A to B when we scale from 10,000 users to 100,000 users? So that's what non-functional requirements are. Um, and so that, that applies to the testing side of things. So functional testing, your testing, does this actually work? Non-functional testing, you're looking at those non-functional requirements around usability, reliability, scalability, all of those things that we'll cover in a lot more depth tomorrow. Super, great questions coming in today. So, um, finally, Darren then, so the, t tell us about these uh, unicorns or um, purple squirrels. Sure, so software developers and tests, so what these guys are essentially doing is, uh, like I said on the tin, they're testing using tooling frameworks and developing them themselves. So their objective is to find solutions to testing problems that take it one step past what uh, an automation tester is doing. So uh, think about these guys as, um, as always going above and beyond because they can develop their own frameworks. They can find a problem and write a, a tool for it quite quickly, whereas an uh, automation tester is reliant on that framework and, and tooling already being there. So the advantage is that it's even less labor intensive because you don't need multiple automation testers there you can just get the software to run it themselves and there's less reliance on the software engineers allowing them more time for deployments that includes devops like people have raised the disadvantage is that there are very rare scale skill in the market what you're essentially looking for is a software developer who uh is interested in moving into into a test environment which not everyone is uh and as uh, phil i'm sure you'll add a little bit more onto this but you'll often find that these people come from a software engineering background and move into this you don't get people that come out of university with an step background people will come out as an as a software engineer and then move into this 
they tend to be very rare and very, very expensive. Yeah, so previously there was a natural progression between manual and automation, and, and there still is, sorry, uh, there, there still absolutely is, but that was kind of the route, whereas now you do find automation testers kind of coming straight out of university, grads, uh, people starting their career as an automation tester. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. With an SDET, typically they've got uh, some experience behind them, and that's either as you know, a very experienced automation tester who has taught themselves to code or, or been taught to code within their organization, um, I know a couple of companies we work with, uh, that was a, a focus they had. They were going to turn some of their automation testers into uh, SDETs by obviously working with them um, to, to upskill them on the, the coding side of things. Um, but yeah, the, the other route is, you know, senior software developers who um, are looking to work on kind of internal tooling projects. So I think Apple, who we, we worked with for, for, for quite a while, they have, uh, this is a, a discipline within the business, Capital One, I think potentially Vodafone as well, um, yep. developers that are focused on the internal infrastructure and tooling. So they're not working on your product that's going out to market. They're ensuring that your internal systems are as efficient as possible so that, yes, they're not contributing to the product, but the 10 devs that are can do their job quicker, can test their code faster. Um, there are obviously other tools that can be created internally to, to, to speed things up. Um, and it does go along with a strong DevOps culture. But yeah, you can think of them um, in the same way as, as any developer who's focused on uh, kind of internal innovation, um, internal tooling, and increasing the, the speed and, and capacity of, of the teams around them, rather than actually, you know, contributing directly to the, the website or the, the product itself. Cool. Okay. So moving on then, Dan, tell us about some of the testing technologies that these guys will be using. So Selenium essentially, I'll run past this one quite quickly because it's what we've been talking about. So Selenium essentially mimics the uh, mimics what a, uh, a manual tester would be doing. So it allows you to press 100 buttons in a minute rather than a manual tester pressing 100 minutes in, in an hour. Uh, 100 buttons, should I say, in an hour. Uh, Cucumber. So Cucumber essentially is looking at um, a functional validation. So what it's doing is it allows there to be a bridge between tech and non-tech. So BAs and PMs. To developers so what it is it's a testing functionality that allows everything to be written in english so that both sides can understand it and both sides will then be able to say okay is this going to reach if this test passes is this going to reach what i what i need it to from a user perspective postman essentially is looking at mainly testing on server side and can be done in kind of any language but it's often utilized for api testing for example uh, and then JMeter is talking about what we were talking about earlier with load and stress uh, testing. So that's measuring uh, the performance of websites. So it's looking at our website is going to go from taking 100 users a week to taking 60,000 users a week. Can the current um, code base deal with that, that uh, uplift in, in users? So it's looking at that kind of that performance uh, side of things. Anything you want to add there, Phil? No, to be honest, I think that's quite a, a, a thorough explanation of those. We've got a couple of questions to touch on very quickly. Um, so first of all, this is a shout out uh, to a question that we will be answering at the end. So Ryan Millwood has asked, um, do testers exist because devs aren't doing their job properly? We are going to touch on that uh, yeah. right at the end and that kind of uh, juxtaposition between a dev that unit tests and, and where kind of testers fit into that. So we will, yeah. we will absolutely get onto that one. Um, but one thing I kind of wanted to, to, to ask now is, um, so uh, Rory Ledson has asked, the progression he sees is from SDET to senior, well, he said SSE, I'm guessing that's senior software engineer. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think it's important to, absolutely important to, to, to mention, that of course, you can, you can go and become an SDET and then go back into a soft, senior software engineering role. Um, we do see that, you know, that, that, that happening, but when you're talking about the background of an SDET, typically they've been quite an, an experienced automation tester or a senior software developer before, but 100%, you can flip that back the other way as well. Yeah, like I think that we, I can see that as a route. It's not a route that we tend to see, but you definitely could go from manual to automation to SDET to software engineer. And like the, the, the tech space is, it's a weird old world. Like I remember that when I first joined HackerJob, we placed a, uh, a project engineer, I think he was a design engineer, a Jaguar Land Rover and he ended up being a DevOps engineer in his next role. So I think it all often comes down to where your interests lie. If you want to, if you want to earn and learn a new skill, 
it's definitely possible. So yes, you can see that progression. There's not one we can see at least. Yeah. And just very quickly, just to confirm one of the abbreviations there. So API is application programming interface. And you'll see <coughs> API is used across all of all of development again. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, I think we'll probably we'll probably delve into um, the, the APIs in I think tomorrow's session, Phil. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll touch on it. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll look at um, some RESTful APIs. I think a little bit earlier on in the session. Yeah, we'll explain a, a little bit how, about how those work. And BDD uh, is um, so we're going to touch upon these a little bit later. But BDD is behavioral driven development yeah. um, compared with uh, TDD, which is test driven development. We're going to I think uh, these might be coming up on. Yeah, the, they're on the next topic. slide. I think there are two or three slides up. Absolutely. Great. Um, yeah, I think the other comment, uh, I think, in terms of the roles people move, um, there's maybe slightly different trends um, in the permanent market where people are going through upskilling. But I've also seen people go from um, engineer uh, from back and forth between DevOps and engineering roles, particularly in the contract market, um, with more senior experience guys for sure. Um, cool. So um, we want to find out some recruiter insights about this market. So, so we'll skip past this quite quickly because everyone will be getting a copy of this, but this is essentially what we see in the market. What I would say is that the availability of talent doesn't really take into account SDEP. Um, so testers in general, there's quite a lot of them out in the market. It's just finding the right kind of tester for you because testing, um, like I said, it starts very broad. So it could be anything from a mobile tester to a front end tester to a back end tester. So testers are often, lumped into one where it's very very broad so it's finding the right tester for you manual testers you've kind of got the the salaries there for the different areas and then there's some job titles that you might see um, i don't think there's a huge amount of to add on that stuff and how how important is like the domain experience that a, a tester has worked in maybe an e-commerce versus a SaaS or a financial services um uh environment compared to, to compared to software engineers um so uh, I would personally say that it, it probably matters more the less the vertical that you've worked in and more what you've worked with. So mobile testing is very, very specific to you're working with completely different frameworks to what a back end person would be doing. But in terms of what you're doing vertical wise, not a lot changes slightly in financial services, but not a huge amount. Got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Right then. So, I think we mentioned these earlier. So the different types of uh, testing we're going to do. So Darren, talk us through these. Cool. So unit testing is essentially you are writing code to test your own code. So it's generally written in the same language as what you do, uh, what you've uh, programmed in, and essentially you're breaking everything down into very small, minute pieces. So I went through this analogy the other day, but I'll do it again. So unit testing. Think about uh, Instagram. So when you post something on Instagram, you'll have a picture and then you'll have below it some information about it was posted two days ago at what time. If you're not doing unit testing and someone joins your company and isn't familiar with your code base, what could happen is they could change the, the syntax or change uh, simply a letter and that changes everything. Um, so suddenly you could have all the Instagram posts going out saying this was posted 10 mims ago rather than mins ago. So unit testing is making sure that you are looking at every different piece of code so that it should mean that that kind of problem and mistake doesn't happen. So it's uh, almost idiot proofing everything is probably the best way to, to put it, uh, but it's really important in modern software engineering. Phil, anything to add? Uh, yeah, well, it just allows you to focus in on specific bits of the code rather than testing, you know, a, a huge yeah. code base. Oh, that doesn't work. Great. Which bit is it that's broken? It exactly. On, on the, 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 the single bits. Um, and then, yeah, I think we're going to come on to TDD in a second. Yep. So yeah. I'll take you through this at the start. Phil did a great analogy the other day, so I've uh, championed him to do it again. But essentially, test-driven development is you're developing your tests before your logic, which if you have never uh, been in, in a, in a uh, technical environment, that seems very illogical. Um, but essentially, your, the results should uh, identify clean code. And also you're looking at only writing code should something fail, which means firstly, it's a lot less uh, time intensive and also you're avoiding a lot more duplications. So I don't know if you want to do your analogy again. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to touch on something else very quickly before. So we had this question right at the start, so I've been saving it up. So um, this is an anonymous user. So one of the hiring managers had said that um, an interviewee, their approach to testing was weak. 
Um, how would we, you know, how, how, how would I have found that out beforehand? What, what could I have looked for? So I think the first thing to work out is what is the testing approach that your hiring manager wants? Because there are multiple approaches you can take. Um, so the first thing you need to do is really pin him or her down on what is it that you're looking for in terms of the approach. And then obviously once you've got that information, so for example, if it was test driven development as the approach, then, then you can start to use that as a barometer when you're speaking to candidates, you know, to assess have you worked in a TDD manner before? Are you comfortable with it? Do you understand it? And you can start to do that. But obviously, if your hiring manager has a different approach that he's looking for or she is looking for, then again, you need to you need to dig into that first before you can then start to really assess the, the, the candidate's approach itself. Um, so yeah, TDD itself, the analogy I used the other day uh, was essentially what it is like is if you cast yourselves back to university or school or whenever the last time uh, you were asked to kind of write an essay, it's essentially like writing a 10,000 word essay and in a normal sense, uh, so without using TDD, you'd write that 10,000 word essay, you'd not check any of the spelling, any of the punctuation, any of the commas, anything at all, all the way through, you'd get to the end and then you'd go, right, I'm going to go back through this whole thing, spell check it, make sure the punctuation is correct, all of this sort of stuff. Whereas using TDD is essentially using Grammarly or, or spell checker as you go. So as you go, you're fixing the mistakes. You're not leaving a whole big uh, 10,000 word essay to go back through with a fine tooth comb and fix everything. You're fixing it as you move through it in stages. So it'll take you a little bit longer to get to the end, but when you get to the end, it's finished. Um, obviously in that analogy, yeah, it might take you two hours to go back and fix the, the punctuation and spelling within an essay, when you're talking about that as a, a project that a developer might have worked on for, for, for weeks, then obviously that time frame gets, gets longer and longer. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the analogy I threw out the other day. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the uh, analogy. Always helpful. We had philosophy from uh, Silvio yesterday and a uh, plethora of analogies today from Phil and some, uh, some great questions from our mysterious anonymous uh, users uh, today. <laughs> So finally, in, in this uh, section, um, Darren, talk us about behaviour-driven uh, development or BDD. Sure. So um, BDD, like uh, at the top, stands for behaviour-driven development. And what you're essentially looking for, it's a, a collaborative approach to tech and non-tech to ensure projects are meeting business needs. So like with Cucumber, you're looking at making sure that everything is obvious to everyone so there isn't a misunderstanding from the tech team about what you're looking to achieve. So BDD follows a certain structure. It's got context, when and then. Just give you uh, an analogy. So um, the, the context might be context trying to log into uh, into Facebook. When would be when do when I put in my uh, in my details? Then would be then it will allow me into Facebook. It has a lot of different um, verifications, or it has a, a lot of different ways that you can you can look at it. So you need to take into account other ways that it, uh, the test could work. So it could be context when looking into Facebook, uh, when I enter my details, then um, it, uh, the, my details aren't right. So it sends me to forgotten password page. So you need to take into account all the different things that a user might do so that you're still getting them to where they need to go to get to the right answer. So that's a BDE approach. Got it. And somewhat relates to sort of UX uh, and design conventions exactly. where you're not having these dead end uh, journeys in, in, in the user flows of the product as well. Exactly. Yep. Right. So we're going to now change tack from testing and QA and look at databases. So um, why are databases so important to uh, product and engineering teams? Well, I think um, people now starting to use this term data with the new oil. So um, you can see here the image of these um, big tech giants like Amazon and Google and Facebook, obviously collecting huge amount of data and new startups like Uber, very much using that data to drive the, the day to day performance uh, of their products. And so where there's data, there are databases. So Darren, talk us through um, some, some database facts. Cool. So essentially what a database is, it's a collection of data stored out electronically. So uh, the easiest way to think about it is an Excel spreadsheet. That Technically, you could call that a, uh, a very manual database. Um, so a question that often gets asked is, do, do you hire database developers or is this a skill that back-end developers should have? 
And a lot of time it probably depends on the size of the organization and how that organization works. So um, we see a lot of the time that a lot of tasks that are, are now uh, considered to be uh, back-end tasks historically would have been database developer tasks. And a lot of tasks that historically would have been, um, you'll hear a term um, database administrator, so DBA, that's a lot of those tasks are now taken away by some back-end stuff, but a lot of data engineering stuff as well. So um, I know Oracle, me and Phil were talking this morning, Oracle still have a lot of database developers with their own software. So um, there are some areas, some companies that do still use database developers, but as a whole within the modern market, we see a lot less than we historically would have. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like data warehousing obviously has become a, a buzzword within data engineering. Um, ETL developers, so ex extract transfer load, I believe it is, um, yep. have a lot of data warehousing responsibilities, which as you said, has, has kind of kind of moved into that um, database development patch in, in, in terms of certain, certain uh, responsibilities. I guess as well as seeing these kind of legacy players like Oracle and SAP, um, I think what we're starting to see in the market is a lot of um, new startups trying to solve the problem of, of integrating data uh, between each other. So I think we're going to touch a little bit on that uh, coming up. So tell Just us about relational databases. Sorry, Phil, go on. Sorry, yes. Yeah, so we've got loads of questions coming through. Still got loads of good ones on testing that we haven't had the chance to answer yet. Obviously, we're keen to get through the, uh, the full presentation. There's still quite a lot of good information on databases. And we've got some interesting uh, recruitment challenges at the end, which will answer a couple of these questions. Um, as with every day, we can't unfortunately get to every question during the presentation, but we will 100% make sure we get back to you with these answers. Absolutely. Thanks, Phil. So uh, as my job is to move us swiftly on, Darren, tell us about uh, relational databases. Cool. So relational databases, are, as I was um, mistyped this morning until someone fixed it, uh, I called them um, re uh, rational databases. So related, relational databases are essentially our collection of information that organises data points into defined relationships. Um, so columns and rows is the best way to, to look at them. So you might have, um, if I'm Amazon, I might take your information on um, your name, your address and your mobile number. Um, and they will be stored into one database or several databases for key relationships between them. Um, one of the advantages of it is that if you are a small organization, it's very easy to store this data and get it. It's when you move to a, uh, a much bigger organization. So if you look at Amazon, um, they probably will have as many non-relational databases as rela uh, relational databases. So it depends on what you're trying to get from the data which yeah. one you're going to use, but we'll move on to non-relational in a second. Yeah, and I think if you're dealing mainly in numerical data, then they're almost perfect. If what you want to do is add, subtract, give me an average, what's the percentage on this? So you're looking at like monetary stats or, or, or things like that, uh, then, then they're ideal. It's when you're trying to get uh, more complex data, so whether that's written or even like images and things like that, then you need to be looking at more complex uh, databases. Right, sure. These are just a couple of the tools that you're, you'd be looking at. So um, apologies if you don't know what the, the elephant in the room is, if you like. Um, so that's Postgres. So Postgres is mainly used for uh, Python and Node. Um, SQL Server, um, which is the bottom left, is mainly used for .NET applications. So anyone has got a .NET stat, we'll see that quite a lot. Uh, MySQL is often used with PHP and uh, Java stacks. And then SQL is just a querying uh, language that's often used for uh, for the internal systems. Um, so they've all got slightly different functionality as well. So Postgres is mainly used for object relational uh, database stuff, whereas um, MySQL is, is purely relational database stuff. Thanks, Tom. Cool. Uh, so now we get a little bit more complicated. So non-relational databases. So what that is, is Essentially, in layman's terms, it just doesn't follow uh, the relational model. So um, it isn't always stored in, in rows and columns. Um, but like I say, companies will be using both in, in a likely event. So the reason you would use a non-relational database is that it's very easy to pull the data without having to pull the entire list. So in a, non -re in a relational database, you couldn't pull uh, a simple column or a, a, t a certain field you'd have to pull every bit of data, which as you can appreciate, with billions of lines of data, can be quite time consuming to do. So that's, yeah. I think 
we'll cover non-relation databases in more depth just in terms of how they're used next week when we look at uh, data engineering, data science. Obviously, the main responsibility, basically, of a data engineer um, is to be querying these, these, these non-relational databases and extracting the right information from that kind of dynamic uh, area where there's lots of good kind of different data points floating around. Data scientists essentially make sense of that data. So we'll cover that in a lot more detail next week. Um, but yeah, they're primarily associated, not always, but often associated with big data. Um, big data can be anything from, you know, a data set with millions of data points where it's just too big for one machine to handle, or it could be one image file that NASA has taken from kind of the Hubble telescope, and they need to be able to focus it on a, kind of one area of it to really kind of analyze, uh, analyze it, sorry. Um, so yeah, database, big data doesn't necessarily mean lots of files. It could be one huge file. It's basically any data that's too big for one computer to, to, to kind of handle or one machine to handle. Um, and typically you'll find them associated with non-relational databases. Yep. Okay, thanks guys. Um... Cool, so this is where we get very, very technical. Um, so there's different types of non-relational databases. So uh, document data, uh, non-relation database. So when you're thinking MongoDB or, or CouchDB, essentially what it is is you're searching and indexing based on the content or, or document uh, within that database. Um, a, graphed, uh, a graph, should I say, non-relational database. Um, when I first heard this term a couple of years ago, I thought, very much pretty pictures. Is it doing the same as what a uh, is it doing the same as what data scientist does? No, actually, you're looking at uh, the functionality of that. Is you're looking at a non a, a verb non uh, noun uh, verb search function. So it could be this person lives in London, and then it will pull all the data that is related to that search function. Uh, a column. Um, the best way to describe this is. The, like I say, with a relational database, you need to pull the whole columns and rows. A column database will allow you to search on, on one item. So if you are um, searching on Premier League footballers and you only want to search on teams and you only want to search for Man United, you could go to the teams column and you could search for Man United and it would search all the players within that, um, within that subset and pull all the players through that way. And then key value. Key value is essentially it's pulling... Um, data points, but based on one key value. So this is often used in um, in governmental bodies. So you could use it for national insurance. National insurance. So a key value has to be a unique code to anyone. So a national insurance number is unique to you. So you can pull national insurance numbers, and it will only pull the that number. But it'll pull all the information. So it'll pull through like first name, last name, address, and that's how you would fall within a non-relational for that kind of information. Yeah, and, and it's hopefully what the GDPR as well, right? Because um, then you can pull the information that you can pull it in a way that each piece of information is unique, but you're not pulling the bits of information that would uh, kind of contravene against exactly, GDPR. exactly. Cool. So that hopefully takes us through the wonderful world of non-relational uh, databases. But yeah, wow. So we're really getting uh, down to the nitty-gritty details uh, today. Uh, really impressive, guys. Um... We, I think we went back one there. I'll put in the slide <laughs> one. I think maybe we've got a duplicated slide. Not to worry. Um, so I think uh, we're now looking at um some of the case studies. Or Phil, do we have any how many questions? We've got uh just over ten minutes remaining. So I think we've got um a couple of like recruiter scenarios. Or have we got any questions we want to deal with first? Yeah. So we we're, we've actually got uh, quite a few questions on the second topic that we're about to discuss now. Um, so we'll 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 move on to those. I'm just going to have a quick scan through. Um, can we move to the second topic first, then, and we can come back to this one as the as the first topic afterwards. We've got ten minutes. Yeah. Sure. Um, and then just just quickly, Darren, because we had a, a quick question on this. In terms of the salary data that you you pulled, um, mm. am I right in assuming one that is for London, um, and two that was. Uh, obviously using the hacked up system to kind of look at um, obviously our users and the jobs that we have on, or could you could kind of explain that side? Yeah, sure. Sorry. I should have clarified on that. So the general information that's pulled there is, um, is London based. Um, and it's all, like Phil said, it's looking at the hacker job, um, but it's looking at three key areas. So it's looking at historic placements, which is the main one that we utilize. It's looking at the uh, expectations of candidates within the market. So, if anyone doesn't know, we've got about 115,000 
uh, candidates, not all tests, obviously, within the system. So it gives us a good gauge. And we also look at the job setup. So what are people paying in this market? But generally, we're looking at placements that are done through the system. Great. Um, cool. Yeah. So let's skip on to the second one. We'll have a chat about that because um, that's going to answer quite a lot of questions. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely. We can, uh, we can dive back into the first one. Do you want cool. to one? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our development team currently do, do unit tests. Should we still have a testing function? So there is a, a bit of a debate going on within uh, development at the moment. So there's no right or wrong answer on this. I know some companies do go down the route of just, um, you know, making sure that their, their, their devs are familiar with using automation testing frameworks and things like that. And they're trying to kind of cut out that, that testing need. Uh, I think you see within most big organizations though, that they are still uh, seeing the value of having a, an independent testing team. So probably a lot of it comes down to your, your resources within the business. If you are, you know, a, 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 a sort of 10 man startup or something like that, yeah, perhaps you want to try and make sure that your developers are well-rounded and they can kind of do your, your testing for you. I think once you get to any sort of scale, if you want to be pushing deploys out as quickly as you can, if you want to be ensuring the, the quality of the entire system, um, then you definitely do want to, to have an automation testing team um, as, as well. So, I mean, within, you know, within software development, essentially speed is, is the name of the game. Um, so if you do want to, to be deploying very quickly, then, then having those functionalities um, definitely, definitely helps. So you've obviously got your developers that can kind of test the code and eliminate many of the, the defects within their individual piece of code. But then your QA team can be tackling defects within the customer workflow um, or in the full kind of spectrum of the, the application's functionality. So it comes back to what Dale was saying, uh, I think two slides ago about that user journey, that user experience and how it is very linked. Um, and I think you can see those correlations in manual testing as well, right? Part of the UX uh, researcher's job is clicking on things and seeing how the application works. And mm, this takes a little bit too long or this doesn't act in the same way it does. So there are definite correlations between what a manual tester does and what a UX researcher would do when they're both looking at your system. Um, so your QA team can be more focused on helping to optimize those journeys um, and, and obviously tackle issues that um, kind of span the full system or maybe one developer's code not reacting as well as it could with another developer's code when they're plugged together. So um, it gives you more of a, a, a well-rounded kind of testing approach. Yeah, I think very much, um, I might add, add then to fit that to that, Phil, um, very much depends on the orientation of, the of, the of a cross-functional product team, you know, where those skill sets are strongest among, um, across the, the different members of the team. Absolutely. And, and because you look, there is still a, there is absolutely still a set of responsibilities that are unique to what your automation tester does. Absolutely. You could upskill your devs in those responsibilities, but what you've got to bear in mind is that is then, you know, one of your developers or two of your developers spending a lot of their time on that sort of responsibility. So what's the difference between having one automation tester kind of taking that on, I guess would be uh, my opinion on it anyway. Yeah. So it's maybe yeah. a difference between the, the activity and the, and the function versus actually a, a named role or person within the team to specialise in or something. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, that was going to be my point. Cool. Great. Should we move okay. back to the first one? Yeah, yeah. why not? Uh, so we currently have technical tests as our first stage. This is a, a more recruitment-focused um, question. So in terms of the interview process, is this a realistic uh, process for successful hiring? This is what the so, yeah, so this came off the back of a really interesting conversation that I had uh, with someone in, 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 the, um, in the chat yesterday offline. Um, so I, I think interview processes are, is a very interesting topic because everyone does it a little bit differently and it's how you do it. When it comes to technical tests first, I find that you, especially in this market, it's a very competitive market where you need to really engage people first. So we've worked with a lot of clients in the past that have tried doing technical testing first. And I think it really depends on um, what is your market presence and, and what is the appeal. So um, I would always advise that you, at the very least, put in a, uh, a five, 10 minute call first, an introduction about yourselves, an in introduction about what they would be doing. Because it's, like I said yesterday, it's all well and good talking about this is what we do as a business. So uh, Amazon, we are on an e-commerce site and the biggest e-commerce site in the world. 
but really people care about what they're going to be working on from a tech perspective. So what are they going to get involved with? So is it a realistic process for success for some cases, but I feel not for many. I think that really the best processes that I see is the ones that are going to get the developers the most engaged. So a call at the start, and then if you want to do a hire manager call and then a technical test, or and then a face-to-face, or a, uh, a process that works really well with a lot of our clients is a phone interview, a hiring manager call, which is a technical call, challenge call, so asking them very technical questions, and then doing some kind of whiteboarding uh, exercises at a face-to-face stage or some pair programming, um, and then uh, off the stage. That's what I find works best. Phil, yeah. you, you obviously work on the talent side, so what's your opinion on this? Yeah, I, I think uh, at times we just need to have a bit of empathy. You know, you need to put yourself in their shoes a little bit. Um, for <laughs> it's, it's obviously not my job to kind of rank where your company would would be obviously i don't know which companies you guys are working for but you know be realistic about where your company is in the market of course if you're an amazon and apple or at that end of the scale or, or, or one of you know the, the unicorn scale ups in london yeah you probably can get that buy in just from your name if you are within the 80 percent of companies that kind of don't <laughs> fall into that that bracket or 90 percent chances are you're going to have competitors in the marketplace. So put yourself in their shoes. If you are on the market, you've got five to 10 companies that are all kind of wooing you and trying to, trying to get you interested. Um, if you can't see massive differences between the tech stack and the culture, because let's face it, a lot of companies, there, there are quite a lot of similarities, then potentially you're going to go with the passive path of least resistance the easiest one to do the one that doesn't involve a tech test straight away where i can actually have a chat i can ask questions i can make sure that i actually want to go forward for this role before i commit my time to uh to to, to be doing a a technical test um so i think just understanding that is is important and if at that point you still decide no this is the way to go then fine you might end up you know the, the ones that do the test yes you know they're keen but they might not be as talented and they might not be able to add as much of your business to your business sorry as the ones who chose not to and chose to go to one of your competitors because they weren't putting a tech test in front of them straight away. So it really does come down to, uh, I guess, where you see yourself in the market um, and whether you think you're losing out on good talent by having this um, as your, your first stage. And I guess as a, a final point, it also probably depends on how long your technical test is. I've heard of uh, quite a few in the market that people are asking a developer on, on a first uh, first reach out to do a full project so build like a, an API or something like that which is time consuming it's take four to six hours if I'm a if I'm a developer and I've got 10 people that are interested in me and nine of them are saying okay we just want to have a conversation tell you a little bit more about it and then you might have a an hour test to do for us I'm going to do the, the other nine because it means I've, I've got seven process so I can probably get through while I'm building this this API for you so um be re- like Phil said, be realistic about what you're looking for, for someone to do. The more resistance you put in front of you, yourself, the less talent you're going to get through. Because these people are busy. They've got their own, they've got their own jobs plus the, the, uh, the interview processes they're doing for you. Yeah, and we've heard the answer from companies before. Oh, well, if they're not interested enough to do the test, why would we want to hire them? And that's fine. But three months down the line when you haven't made your hires and you haven't been able to uh, push live what you wanted to push live, then, then that's, that's why. <laughs> that, that's why yeah. you- uh, yeah. should have a bit. Great, so guys. Just yeah. conscious of the time, we've got um, two minutes left. Uh, fascinating to hear some, I think, a lot of uh, real life experience coming through from the guys today. And we've got one more question that we can uh, get, get from the, the, the QA uh, list, Phil. Yeah, so it's just a, a quick clarification on two things. So, one, we've had a question on white box and black box testing. So, Darren has gone through that a little bit earlier. I'm not going to get him to reiterate now just for the time, but if anyone wants to listen back, skip through to that slide. Darren's given a good explanation of that a bit earlier. Um, and then finally, Darren, is SpecFlow written in English? Uh, that's I believe. A very good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to. I was going to say, I believe it is, um, yeah. but I don't want to give an answer and then find out that I'm wrong. So we both believe that SpecFlow is written in English because it's, it's a, a functional validation tool. So Feel free to Google and prove us wrong, but I am, I am 95% <laughs> yeah. sure it's, it's written in English. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say I'm 95, so you've got an extra 4% on me. <laughs> cool. Uh, Dale, have we got a few slides to wrap up? Oh, okay, coming up. Uh, that one we've seen already. So, yes, we've got uh, the quiz again so i think that's that link is on the screen i think also being put in the chat again um and then the final slide is just a reminder tomorrow's session again at 12 you'll get the uh, link emailed to you but any issues with that 
um, email hello at HackerJob and tomorrow's sessions on modern software engineering. So um, uh, Phil, do you want to give the, the 10 second pitch of, of uh, what we're covering there? Yep, four modern languages, Scala, Kotlin, Go and Rust, and then I think five different modern concepts within software development that we've touched on throughout this week. So a lot of your questions uh, that have been coming in may get answered tomorrow. Look forward to seeing you all. Great. Uh, I think that's a perfect moment to leave it. Thank you very much. Uh, and any more real life challenges, also um, you can email them through to us at hello yeah. at Hacker Job, and we'll, we'll hopefully be able to cover some of those um, over the course of tomorrow and next week. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for joining and uh, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. To go to the bottom. bottom.